Hello. Woo, good. Still alive? Yeah. Right. My name is Jaren Sage. I'm representing the Peace Mob. The Peace Mob is an organization that is completely grassroots. It's coming out of Flint, Michigan. Um, it's based around the concept of positive autonomous action. And so what this is, is a group of individuals that all stand up to do a lot of the things that need to be done that don't necessarily have monetary compensation for it. Um, we do self-sustainability education, we do neighborhood revitalization. Um, in Flint, I don't know if you guys know, we have a lot of burnt down properties. Um, this, this is a really big problem. There's been thousands of fires in the last two years, leaving lots of toxins, lots of vacant space. And so, uh, something that the Peace Mob started to do is urban farming. I know a lot of people around here. Can you guys hear me okay? Is this better? Um, a lot of people over the last couple of few years have been dabbling into urban farming a lot more. Uh, this particular project, like I said, is completely grassroots and that it was formed by a couple of buddies sitting on a porch, uh, just kind of looking across the street at this super dilapidated neighborhood uh, that we live in. It's been three years now, and over three years we have 15 properties. They're all pretty much adjacent in one area. There's six houses right now that have people living in them, and uh, there's three more that we're purchasing this year to be revitalizing. Uh, the housing project is something that we call Kersley Park Block Redevelopment Project. This is an LLC that started so that we can have like a legal name and a legal backing because everything else is completely off paper. Uh, supported by donations and the individuals that make it up. Um, Kirsten Park Block Redevelopment Project spawned last year out of the necessity of revitalizing these homes because we realized that our city is, does not have enough money to properly demolish these houses. So they sit vacant, uh, feral cats, dogs, drug addicts, all kinds of crazy things show up in these houses leaving them horrible. So what we're doing is building an intentional community on the east side of it. Uh, right now we have 12 people that are actually staying over there that all kind of act as stewards of the land. Um, every year it's a completely involved situation from the very beginning all the way through where we decide the layout of our garden, different pathways, different techniques and different plants that we're going to be growing there. And what separates us from a lot of the other gardens in our city is that uh, most people in gardens try to grow food and flowers for profits. And what we're doing is creating demonstration gardens that can show people uh, the necessity and also the ease of beautifying your neighborhood while providing your neighbors and yourself with, with fresh, good foods. And, uh, to get more on the fresh good food side, um, I mentioned before that most of our lots are on um, burnt down properties that have lots of toxins, lead, asbestos, all sorts of crazy heavy metals in the soil. And so it's important that we do a lot of different techniques such as lasagna gardening, which is very beneficial for any urban farm. And so if you're good, if, at any farm at all really, uh, if you plan on growing something, I recommend this technique. And what this is, you're going to use biodegradable materials such as leaves or wood chips. And what you're going to do is you take uh, a layer of newspapers and then you put a layer of these compostable materials down, layer of newspapers, layer of compostable materials, so on and so forth, until you get this really nice thick substrate. Now what this is going to do it covers your ground so that you don't get weeds that pop up through, just like ground cloth. It also acts like a sponge to retain moisture, and so you don't have to water as much. On most urban farms, you don't have water source. You don't have electrical source. And so it's going to be very important to keep as much of that rainwater as possible soaked right there on the top of the ground. Um, and lastly, what this does is it separates your actual fruits and your edible foods from that ground that had all that toxic, potentially toxic things in it. 
Uh, every year that you do this, it will leave behind an inch or two of very fresh, good soil. Um, and the way that your plants, generally speaking, work is they're going to send a tap root straight down, and then they're going to have a bunch of smaller roots that all go out, and they're going to take the easiest route towards their nutrients and towards their water, which will be through that lasagna garden. And so you aren't going to be leaching any of those toxins up through your, well, you're going to be minimizing the amount of toxins leached up through that soil. And so uh, lasagna garden is very important. I hope everybody does that if you're going to be doing that, if you're going to be growing anything. Uh, second, very important thing that we do uh, the water catchment systems. And now, like I said, we don't have water supplies on any of these places. We have a lot of area to water. And so, and dry, dry years like last year, uh, it's very important that you build some sort of trough system, collection system. What we have out there is just simple troughs off of a shed that was remaining. Uh, those go into just basic water barrels that we have elevated so that we can have some pressure. Um, so that's like the, the farming part of it. You know, it's pretty, pretty self-explanatory. We like to grow everything and anything that we can possibly get in there so that the, the visitors that come through there have an opportunity to see what a tomato plant looks like and how it grows, to see what the beans look like, to see when they come through. Um, because we do host a lot of kids and student groups, a lot of summertime activity groups come out there. Uh, Youth Quest is one. I don't know if you guys have something like that around here. But, uh, they come out in groups of anywhere from 20 to 50 students, and we set them up on workshops. And so what we do here is simple introductions to things like self-sustainability, uh, by generating your own power. We're going to touch on that pretty soon. Jay brought some things to talk about solar. Um, we also teach things like introduction to arts. And introduction to arts is, is not necessarily buying some paint and a paintbrush and making it, but we do a lot of reusing and recycling of trash and things that people wouldn't normally use as art mediums and let these kids come out and create uh, some structures. Last year we made a greenhouse out of two meter pop bottles and so all these kids brought some work gloves and they brought two, two empty two liter bottles, cut them all up and built a giant wall out of them that we then attached to the side of uh, the, the other three sides were made out of windows out of a, out of a house that we recycled. And so just simple little projects like that that they can actually get hands on involved with. Um, and so, like, you know, there's, there's not really a membership process to this either. Um, based around the idea of positive autonomous action, this is all about you and your, and, uh, your level of involvement that you choose to put yourself in. And so just by simply showing up to things like this, by asking questions, by being interested in a different way of living is already the first step towards that positive autonomous action because you're not talking, you're doing. And um, yeah, that's the, the strongest part that we have there. We don't ask many questions as far as um, permissions from our city, from anything like that because the more questions you ask, the more no's you potentially hear. So we do things like raise pigs, we have chickens, we have some goats this year that we hadn't had last year, so I'm not sure how they're going to work out, but they seem kind of wild. Um, but you know, these are the things that they're not allowed in our city. But I can't make any sense of why they aren't allowed in our city if it's actually going to be able to benefit that community that they're in. And so, um, you know, by experimenting with how far we can push the law and how far we can push the limits will determine uh, like the future of this project, what's going to happen next. Um, by pushing those laws, we've already changed a couple laws in our in our city. Um, with the demolition code, they say every single thing on a property has to go if it's getting demoed by the city. And that's like, uh, it's really good for a lot of those properties, but some of those properties have secondary structures such as 
garages or sheds or something, that if you're going to be having an urban farm, you have to have somewhere to store your stuff, you have to have somewhere to collect water off of, and there's a million reasons. And so we changed the laws that uh, secondary structures can be saved on lots if it's used for urban farming. And so that law, you know, just simply by pushing that law sometimes, you can actually break it and bend it and get it changed. But until you try these grassroots, outside of the box type methods that uh, aren't written necessarily on paper, you're never going to know the possibilities that, that a group could do. Um, and so, you know, uh, when you start looking at why people are not allowed access to a lot of this um, self-sufficient technology and self-sufficient way of living, why you can't grow certain stuff at certain places or raise animals certain things, uh, those are all questions that we try to ask, but more than just talking about resolutions, we try to get to the bottom of it. You know, we'll try to expose that issue to our community as much as possible, um, try to really get involvement from the people so the city is then forced to listen to us. Um, we also have a lot of fun. We have a lot of fun out there. It's a huge open space. We have giant bonfires. We have a good music scene. Um, before a couple of the houses that were there actually did get demolished, we would do things like giant murals across the entire house. You know, so a lot of really cool um, art projects have come out of this. Um, I would say two years ago, yeah, about two years ago was probably our biggest year that we had had. Um, there's about 200 people or so that would show up there on the weekends, and so. 200 people, you're just like, what do, you, what do you even do with 200 people in a little neighborhood, you know? And so it's been very beneficial and it's been, it's been almost a blessing to be able to see all of the people come out there and stand up, take initiative on their own autonomously to stand up into those leadership type positions. And what we find is that through that positive autonomous action, it, it produces more positive autonomous action and spreads almost virally um, to the point where like it's like if you clean up your yard your neighbors probably going to end up cleaning up their yard because it initiates them to want to do something so uh, the peace mob really just tries to really tries to just influence other people to get off their butt and do something you know it's the difference between walking down the street and picking up the trash that you see or walking down the street and just walking <laughs> past it even though you saw it. You know, it's those little differences that make that make sense. So, you know, if you, uh, if you ever come to Flint, definitely come by, check us out. We're going to be doing lots of tours of the city. Is uh, We got a couple buses in Flint that we ride around, and so uh, it'll be all over the Facebook. There's a Facebook page called Peace Mob Gardens. And there will be a lot of updates there. But we have a work day coming up on Thursday. It's going to be our first work official work day of the year. We're going to get everything ready for rototilling. We're going to sit down and actually design our layout and what we're going to have where. And so anybody can be part of that. You know, if you want to come, come help actually figure out what we're going to be doing this year, feel free to do that. But um, those tours, like I was saying, be a lot of fun. We'll go around the whole city, check out a lot of the different beautification projects, and also check out a lot of the different blight around our city because it is ugly. But in comparison to the beautification projects, it really can can create that segue and that bridge in your mind of why it is important that people stand up and take care of your own communities. You know, why it's important that instead of having trash laying everywhere, you plant flowers. Um, the kids growing up in this neighborhood, they're subject to violence, they're subject to crime, they're subject to influence of using drugs and alcohol, um, and it's, it's a shame to see basically most of the city like that. And so when you have a little light right in the middle of somewhere that the kids ride their bikes past every day, you know, uh, they stop by just to see what's going on because it's the best thing for them, and really one of the only things going on. 
And uh, so, you know, I, I really look forward to this year. I've got a lot of interest from a lot of different cities. And, uh, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure there's going to be a lot more for me to be able to say once we start rolling this year because we haven't really gotten anything off the ground. Um, I'm going to have t-shirts soon. That's kind of Different merchandise. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm just kind of talking up here now. I don't know if you guys have any questions about urban farming or, or peace mob over here. We'll go yes, um, are you still doing the soil reclamation where you save the soil that allows you to grow next to the home? Yeah, we have, we have two different things that we do with that. We have compost site that we have, and so a lot of people in the neighborhood and Surprisingly, people from outside of the city of Flint, from the suburbs, actually pack up all of their compostable food stuff and bring it out there sometimes. And so, we're creating new soil. But as far as the as far as the toxic soil that we have in there, the best thing that we can do, and the only thing we can do, is continually mix in um, different compostable materials and try to um, get it not so concentrated. You know, because there's certain state levels of toxicity for all these different types of materials that you can have that make it still healthy. Um, and so to get them down to those levels, that's where the, we come in with the lasagna gardening. And so over time, we're looking at, I mean, it's going to be a five, ten year process before we have some of our lots to where we can even plant edible foods. You know, in certain sections of our lots will do uh, just flowers or beautification stuff, non-edibles. But it's, it's just a long-term process, but in time, we will definitely have really high quality soil. Have you thought about using uh, penny crushed uh, vegetables for your soil? It's, it's kind of a weed, but it will suck all of the toxins out of the soil, and also have the high oil content, and it can be used for uh, biodiesel. Absolutely. Um, I haven't used that one specifically. I'm not familiar, but there's definitely a lot of bioremediation what that is and that's when you have a um, whenever you grow something you're gonna have some materials and nutrients taken out of the soil and some put back into the soil by that same plant and so what this gentleman is speaking about is there's some plants that are designed by nature to remove things such as lead or um, zinc you know, um, there's like mustard seed takes care of zinc. It'll pull all that stuff out of the soil. Now, what you have to do there is make sure that you get rid of completely those plants. Because now if you're going to be growing all those flowers and plants, pull them up, put them in your compost, when they break down, it just leaves all those metals back in your compost. You mix it back in the soil and you didn't get rid of anything. You know, so definitely those, those tactics are being used. Um, but the amount of time that it takes and the, I mean, you'd, you'd have to sacrifice multiple growing seasons to plant enough of it for it to actually leach that stuff out. And so it's very valuable in a lot of places. Um, in New Orleans, we did that for the wetland project after Katrina came through because it just wiped everything out. And so uh, we had to use a lot of bioremediation that's still growing there today, but that's long term. You know. Good. Yes, it is in the process. Actually, uh, my buddy Phil right now um, is in the mycology lab getting everything ready as we speak. Um, I'm glad you touched on that because I'm kind of uh, not thinking about that right now. I got a lot on my mind. But the one of the biggest projects we have this year, I can't believe I didn't think about this. It's uh, we have a Kickstarter that's about to be going on. It's Kickstarter.com. I mean, this is a hobbit house. It's uh, completely illegal. Completely not okay to build one of these things. And we're doing it anyways because it's going to be awesome. Uh, what this hobbit house is, is we've been collecting 8 to 10 inch um, in diameter logs that are anywhere from 12 to 15 feet long. And these are all going to be very carefully and strategically placed, like a teepee almost, so it's going to be a lot wider. And, uh, so you place all these, you, I'm sorry, you dig a hole, and then you put the, the branches on. You cover it with a plastic, with dirt, with straw bale, and then you put more dirt on top of it and plant. So from the road, it's going to appear to be a hill with a bunch of really nice flowers and 
herbs and things like that. Now there's going to be a doorway in the back that uh, you can actually enter this little hut that'll be underground space. Uh, done a lot of research. Phil's done a lot of research and putting this project together, but we're going to have a paper press inside. We're going to have the mycology, which is growing mushrooms. We're going to start with shiitakes and see how that goes. Uh, we're going to have bees inside this place. Uh, we're going to have a, a syrup making area. So it's just going to be a cool little workshop that's going to be underground. Um, the Kickstarter right now, I believe we're asking for like 15,000 bucks to build this whole thing. Um, knowing that it might just get tore down. But it's kind of the whole point of look at what we can build for for $15,000 that's going to be way more efficient, way more sustainable, way more basically everything than your, than your conventional homes that we have here. And it's just going to be fun. You know, but the mycology is going to be a huge part of it. Um, the entire wall is going to be basically just mushrooms all night up in there. So, um, Kickstarter.com, make sure to check out the progress on the Feast Mom Gardens page. And we're going to go out there and try to build that entire thing in like a week, week and a half to try to sneak it in under the radar. You know, so we're going to need a lot of hands on deck if you want to be part of uh, building some sort of actual alternative housing. So, thanks for that. Do we have questions over here? If anybody wanted a tour, how do you get in touch with you guys? Um, you can Peace Mob Gardens on Facebook, or you can get to our garden blog, which has not been updated in forever. I apologize for that. Um, go to thepeacemob.com, and that will take you to the bottom. You then have to click another link to go to the garden blog. So it's just kind of a process, but you can find a lot of info there. Um, I'll also keep posting stuff on the Occupy Flint page. I've been doing a lot of Peace Mob updates on that as well. So. Where's Flint? Where are you? Right now we are on the blocks of Illinois Avenue and Indiana Avenue, which is a uh, Kersley Park neighborhood on the east side. It is pretty close to Mott and U of M. It's about, I don't know, half a mile or so from downtown. Um, it, it's okay. It's not like the worst part of Flint. You know, but it's definitely not the best part of Flint. And so it's a strategic location that we chose um, so that we still have blight issues, we still have crime issues, we still have um, B&E issues, lots of, lots of scrapping issues, which is one of the biggest problems that we have in Flint. Um, you can't have anything inside or outside your house without people trying to take it. And so... Uh, you know, we try to we try to pick that location because we already have a strong presence there as far as a lot of the friends that wanted to be part of this to begin with. Um, they live right there. You know, I live two blocks away from the garden. I just purchased another home three doors down from the garden. So uh, we will be having more residences there also. But 1400 block Illinois Avenue, if you're looking for it. Do you have any more questions about farming or? Oh man, thank you. I'm so glad you guys are here to remind me of all the things I'm supposed to be telling you about. Um, last year, see this slipped my mind because I just got so much on here. Okay, so uh, last year we created, this thing was really cool. We created a 28 foot by 15 foot by 11 and a half foot tall beneficial insect garden. And so it's not up yet, but it's made out of mosquito netting and PVC pipe. I mean, this thing's huge, right? And so we're going to order ladybugs, fireflies, all sorts of different moths and uh, butterflies. And there's these really awesome flies that eat like 50 times the amount of mosquitoes that a bat does every night. So we're going to definitely release those because I hate mosquitoes. But that's, um, that's, I'm not sure how far we're going to get with it this year. I know that the structure will be up, but as far as the actual taking care of and raising the insects and all the bugs, because I don't, I don't know if we're going to have the insects this year, but definitely this year or next year, years to come, we're going to have beneficial insect garden, hopefully able to um, 
package and distribute fireflies and ladybugs to other farmers around the area. Because uh, a lot of the country, think about this, a lot of the country, they don't have fireflies. Could you imagine being a kid and not even knowing what a firefly was? You know? So I thought it'd be kind of cool to be able to produce something like that and um, use that as a fundraiser to be able to, to do more garden stuff. But thanks, Jay, for the beneficial insight card. Yeah. Appreciate it. Um, it kind of reminds me to the way we even got the beneficial insight garden. Um, we hosted, we built a stage out there last year and uh, hosted an event that was called Embers. And this was a play that was created by, uh, it's called Verbatim Theater. And so what you'll do is you go out and you take specific testimonies of people's experiences on a certain topic. And then create a play about using those testimonies as, as the script. So uh, U of M class created this play about all the fires very briefly fires and went around and talked to everyone from police, firefighters, to neighbors of homes that had burnt down, to family of people whose homes burnt down, and created this 90 minute play that we had out there. And about 100 people or so showed up, and through those donations and through all that, the funding that had come through that project, we were able to go purchase that um, material to build that. So we do a lot. We do a lot more than just farming. You know, we try to incorporate all the elements of the community and all the elements of what what it takes to keep doing stuff like this. You know, because you can show up to protests and to movements and things like that where it's all about this agenda. You know, it's all about this one specific purpose or these many purposes that bring you there, and sometimes it it can really burn you out. You know, you can do that for a really long time and it can burn you out. And so with this, we have certain events where it's just like rah, 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 all into it. And other events, we bring a guitar, sit around the campfire, hang out, smoke cigarettes or something. You know what I mean? It's really relaxed, really cool, um, positive, autonomous action force. That's what it's all about. Today, so. I appreciate you guys all showing up here. I appreciate the space and the amazing food. Whoever made that vegan chili, I want the recipe. Right there, that's you? Right. Yeah, that's amazing. Are there any more questions or reminders of things I'm supposed to be talking about? <laughs> no? Okay. Um, well, I still got a couple minutes, and uh, we were going to merge the, the solar thing in with this while we're touching on the self-sustainability and growing foods. Um, just one last thing though is, is you know, it doesn't take much to even just start a small garden in your yard to build a little window box garden and get a couple herbs and spices or something going, you know, and, and the more you grow for yourself and for your neighbors, the less we're going to be feeding the machine um, that just constantly, constantly puts us down, constantly poisons us, and constantly provides uh, those greedy people up top the opportunity to get inside your bodies, you know, inside your minds and stuff. And so we need to just do everything you can, you know, just stop buying stuff from the store, to stop needing to buy stuff from the store. Grow it yourself. Grow it yourself. Find big lots to do it, but... Thank you for your time, for your patience, for your love.